Right, good morning, everyone. You know, I, it's always a perfect test of who are the really serious people who come to Art Basel. They're the ones who show up to a conversation about art schools at 10 o'clock on a Saturday morning. So thank you for, the, for that, and thank you, Mari and Jessica, and thank you, Art Basel, actually, for uh, keeping this forum uh, going. I think, uh, you know, this Art Basel, it's a, it's a multi-tent uh, circus, and it's really great that one of the tents is, uh, is devoted to ideas and coming to terms with the, the context in which, which art happens. Um, today's uh, subject is art schools, their challenges, their opportunities, um, and above all, as the title implies, and very fittingly for this venue, their relationship with the sort of real world of art, the institutional system, the market system, of art into which artists graduate when they come out of school. And this is not, as we will see, it's not a simple uh, relationship. Very quickly, uh, show of hands, who's, who's studied at art school at some point in their lives? Okay, now we see this is, a, this is an audience that has a stake in issue. Who has taught at an art school at some point in life? My goodness. You know, we're leaving. I think the experts are, are out there on, uh, in the audience. Um, so the topic of should artists, art schools prepare artists for the art world, as we put it, has been simmering, uh, I think, for some time. In fact, it's always been a tension underlying uh, schools. Uh, but I think this year has been a particularly ripe uh, moment to take it up, and I'll very briefly uh, say a few words why. Uh, first of all, as you all know, art schools have been in the news to a sort of surprising degree. Um, not always in a good way, I would say in a fantastically bad way in some cases. As has been widely reported, the entire uh, student body at USC walked out, uh, protesting administrative practices and donor uh, influence. Uh, we have uh, one panelist on the stage who experienced a sudden change in the leadership structure of his institution, uh, as many of you have read. Um, uh, and uh, uh, in, in general, higher education is in the news uh, for a number of reasons. Um, meanwhile, on the other side of things, uh, every couple of months we hear interesting announcements about new kinds of initiatives, some of them directly in response to one of the issues we'll talk about here today, which is costs, interesting new initiatives, often artist-driven initiatives, often free of charge, uh, which are uh, adding a lot of excitement around the edges. And I do want to draw your attention that the art newspaper today, the issue that's circulating here, has some examples of these uh, initiatives. Um, for those of us who are based here in the USA, which is three of the four uh, discussants, uh, obviously money is the big burning issue. Uh, but not just in art schools. I mean, uh, there's a tremendous, we're living through an era of great social anxiety and debate around inequality, access. One part of that is higher education and cultural access. And I think uh, art schools have been very much in the crosshairs of this discussion. And for in, you know, obvious reasons, in 1995, tuition at Yale was uh, $14,600. Today, it's $35,000, and Yale is far from the most expensive art school, actually, today. I see Sanford is smiling, Mr. Columbia. Um, by the way, 2015, in $2015, um, that would have been $23,000, so still you're talking about a net 30% increase in that time. I think Roseanne may shed light on why some of these costs are ballooning, or several of you, later on. Um, what is for, for sure is that this, this creates problems on both ends, both in terms of who gets to go and in terms of what are the choices that they then make at the other end saddled with tens of thousands of dollars of debt and how that constrains the freedom to do what you want as an artist and, and, and what kind of career you then embark on. Um, so this is a fact that sort of throws our topic into sharp relief. Um, and, and sort of really begs the question whether schools are then preparing their artists to then cope in the real world, often, frankly, because they are under great pressure to, to make their way, not just as artists, but, but make money. Um, um, 
But it's not an, e not an easy question, as we'll get back later on. I mean, you know, there is a case to be made for the school as an ivory tower, as the last place where, as a young person, you kind of discover yourself and discover art. That's an honest intellectual case that can be made for that, and we'll investigate whether that is a, a stance that schools can take. But the reality remains that artists must survive on an extremely complex, ever more complex, institutional landscape, commercial landscape, and, and production landscape, I should also add. I think the nature of artistic production itself is increasingly complex. And therefore, artists are becoming sort of one-man show, you know, one-man uh, entrepreneurs, brand managers, communicators, uh, managers of studios, uh, makers of commercial deals, spokespersons for entities and brands, and this is not easy stuff to master when you're in your early 20s. And, and I'll stop in a second. Behind all this lurk even bigger questions, which I hope at least we can graze this morning. Um, you know, do the pedagogical methods that are widely used in, in uh, art schools, are they the right approaches? You know, they are legacy methods. Are they, are they, are they the right methods? Um, how should art schools relate to other fields of knowledge endeavor, science, humanities? Are, these, are, the, are the chasms uh, too wide with these fields? Um, you know, um, after a half century of, of um, experience with, with uh, MFA programs, what is the sort of broader legacy of, of, of the institutionally trained artist? And, and what is actually the right kind of art school for the 21st century? Um, um, so these are all big questions that lurk behind um, our discussion. And we have a stellar uh, all-star uh, panel to sort of converse around these issues. I'm going to very quickly say their names, and we'll get back to, uh, I'll say a few more words about them in a minute. But we have Roseanne Summerson, who is the newly, recently installed president of the Rhode Island School of Design. We have Sanford Biggers um, next to, on her right, uh, who's a practicing artist, of course, and an associate professor of visual arts at Columbia. We have Nicolas Bouriaud, who, um, if I may make the stellar uh, blockbuster announcement of the day, he, uh, having left the, <clears throat> the, the uh, School of Fine Arts in Paris uh, last year, he is preparing to go to Montpellier uh, to build a new museum a new public museum from scratch, as I've just heard, so hooray on that. Um, so difficult stories often end very well. And um, Howard Zingerman, uh, on my right, I should mention someone I've been in professional contact for more than two decades, who, in addition to chairing the Department of Art and Art History at Hunter, also sort of wrote the book on uh, art schools and MFA programs. So again, a big hand of applause for them for all of their um, thoughts. Um, so we're, we're going to sort of get going, and then we'll sort of touch on some issues. And given the show of hands we had before, we really must leave time for your, your contributions. Uh, but I'm going to start with Samford, since you are the, we actually have everyone here practices something. And, but you are the practicing visual artist on this panel and somebody who is, of course, a pivotal member of the Columbia faculty. But say a few words about how you uh, felt your way into a career as an artist and whether school prepared you for it. Um, good morning. Um, so, yes, thank you. Um, at risk of carbon dating myself, um, <laughs> I went to get a master's um, a little bit before the recent proliferation of the art world and the recent expansion of the art industrial complex. And coming out of a liberal arts college, uh, Morehouse College in Atlanta, that didn't even have an art program, I was an art major that I, and I cross-registered at a nearby school. So I graduated and seven years later decided it was time to further my arts education. But I really didn't have one to begin with. So I went to MICA and did a post back. And then after that, went to the Art Institute of Chicago, where I got my MFA. And for me, it was pretty essential, because it taught me the language of the art world, both materially and verbally. 
Um, it got me up to speed with many things that were happen happening in contemporary art, whereas before I'd pretty much only gone up to some modern art that I got in survey classes as an undergrad. Um, and then, of course, it gave me the community and uh, introduced me to grants and residency opportunities and all of those lessons have really, you know, I've put forward into my career. Mm -hmm. And um, upon graduation, I was invited to do the PS1 residency as well as the Studio Museum in Harlem residency. And then I took on my sort of my post-master's education, um, you know, on the streets of New York as an artist, so. <laughs> on the streets of New York. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, and through all this, and this will, you know, be our topic today, I mean, um, given, you know, you're now an artist who, you know, shows with galleries, et cetera. Did you feel prepared for that? Um, yeah, actually I did. Um, but my, my priority as an instructor and as an artist, I believe that there is a certain amount of power and empowerment that artists should feel. Mm -hmm. And I think I was very prepared to make a stance and understand what it was to have my own personal studio practice and my own pace mm -hmm. in traversing the art world. Mm -hmm. And I did gain that from you know my both my undergrad and my graduate experience. Mm -hmm. So I think I was prepared to know who I was in the midst of new opportunities mm -hmm. and a new environment. Mm -hmm. And now that you're a practicing professor of art, what would you say, based on your experience, is the biggest issue for art schools in general? Well, I mean, you know, I'm sure we're gonna get into it, but finance, um, yes. and particularly where I am, I'm probably on the you know, most extreme pole of this conversation in terms of that. What's Columbia tuition these days? Um, I think for the MFA, you're, you're looking at around 60. Jesus. I mean, that's including, you know, housing and various things, but I mean, that's a considerable, um, per year. Yeah. That's very considerable. <laughs> so. Yes, <clears throat> my alma mater. Yes, it's, uh, <laughs> it's a tough one. Um, let's go to the other side of the Atlantic. Uh, Nicola, uh, well, we've all heard his great news. Um, but you've come from a career that's really touched every part of the art world. You've been curator at the Tate, co-director at uh, Palais de Tokyo in Paris. Uh, many people here have read you as a seminal critic on relational aesthetics and other things. Um, and of course, you ran this, you know, arguably the world's most classic and important art school in Paris. Um, so tell us what the view is. Now, I know in France, it's not really money. It's about 700 euros, I think, to attend school. Exactly. But what, what, what are the big issues from where, you, looking back on this experience, what's the big issue around art schools? Well, I have to start with stressing on the difference between the American and the European system, you know, mm -hmm. because most of you might not be totally aware of it. But uh, the, traditionally, the European art schools have were completely apart from the universitarian academic system. You know? So the, the issues are very different. Since 2001, and what we call the Bologna process, which is the kind of uh, standardization of the European system, you know, it gets more or less you know, the same structure you know, than the, uh, the academy and the university. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the stakes are actually exactly the, the opposite in some ways. Mm -hmm. And uh, I tried to fight to preserve a kind of uh, uh, independence of uh, the school in front of this kind of bulldozer of the uh, university system. So you see, it's, it's a very different stake. Because I really believe that art schools should be exactly in the middle, in between the art world on one side and the academy on the other side. Mm -hmm. Not because art would be a kind of exception, you know, in the landscape of knowledge, but because I think it's the most, this articulation is absolutely crucial, I think. I always tend to say that I tried to, to, to create, you know, an art school, well, create, not exactly, it's a very long story, but, you know, to turn it into what I called, uh, it's, it's, it's a monastery, in a way, you know, uh, a bit isolated from the world, but every door should lead on to an airport. You know? <laughs> and uh, I think the, my problems came from the fact that they didn't want the airport part, actually, you know, Just more the, the monastery, monastery one. You know? mm -hmm. <laughs> that was already done. Mm -hmm. um, they being the Ministry of Culture or Ministry of Education or the students or the, who is they? The thing is that the, uh, in France, actually, the, the art schools are depending on the Ministry of Culture 
yeah. not education. You see that this this uh -huh. independence, you know, uh -huh. is also coming from here. So it's a tool to be more like actors of the art world. So that was a, it's a kind of a very specific situation, which is kind of interesting also. It allows a lot of possibilities, mm -hmm. uh, but you know, uh, it has, has drawbacks too, actually. Mm -hmm. As you said, you know, it's, it's the fee uh, annual, you know, uh, is uh, more or less 600, you know, uh, 650, seven, $700 yeah, a year, right. more or less. So it's a very different, you know, uh, landscape. Of course, it's particularly interesting to run an institution that in, you know, 200 years ago was the art world of Paris, essentially, was the, the academy, the salons. The, so, um, um, and, and are there, uh, it's okay to name names, are there institutions in your eye that, that approximate this happy midway uh, between the two extremes that you talked about that are great models that uh, you've seen? I think we, uh, singularity is the key word, in a way. Mm -hmm. And every school or every you know, situation is, is, is different, mm -hmm. uh, at least, uh, especially be between Europe and the US. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm not sure that there is a f model that could be followed. You know, every institution has to develop its own you know, path you know, and its own ways you know, mm -hmm. into the art world. Because the, the thing is, well, it's not possible to be completely uh, mm -hmm. into a professional state of mind, mm -hmm. neither. No, it wouldn't be good, mm -hmm. also. I think art schools also um, have to uh, produce, between brackets, you know, individuals who are not only future artists, but also citizens mm -hmm. and human beings. So it's, it's also a legacy of the, what we call the humanities, mm -hmm. uh, and it's one of the last places where you can really mm. deal with that. It's interesting, maybe you're preparing now to be a museum director, but what you just said is exactly what a museum director would say about a museum. Uh, do you see your new museum as, as a school as well, potentially? Uh, uh, what we kind of school? can really see, you know, in the last 20 years is the, the a kind of a mix uh, of all the institutional types, I would say, you know? Schools are actually, yeah, going a little bit into the art world. Museums are also teaching in, in some ways and have a very important educational role. Yeah. So all those roles are actually, you know, uh, in dialogue. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a very good thing. Yeah, I would agree with you. Um, Roseanne, it's been how many weeks? So officially since February. Since February, but the inauguration was just October, a few weeks ago. Yes. Um, but the location for you is certainly nothing new because you've been at RISD for three decades, I think, uh, approximately. And I should say that Roseanne is also a practicing uh, artist, a furniture maker and designer. Um, and you've taken on, you're now the 17th president of Amer one of America's most important uh, teaching institutions for art. Um, so this is not a new environment for you. You've thought about this for many years. You've spoken about it. So uh, we can't get all of the thoughts out, but what are f for you the big overarching challenges for schools, art schools, as you see them? Well, some of the challenges relate to higher ed in general, but I think art schools in particular are uh, misunderstood, um, but I think that's a changing right now. There are, there's never been more attention to the role of creativity in forming society and forming the future. And I often say that we're educating students for jobs that don't even exist yet. It, it, it's not only about jobs, it's really about developing humanity. But there's no better place in my mind for that to happen than in the context of an art and design school, particularly one that's very dedicated to the humanities as well. We have a third of our credits um, required in the humanities because we really do see ourselves as educating creative citizens for the future. But there are particular challenges on higher ed, and I, we, can, we can get into it later about why the cost is so high, but it's actually not so much about pedagogy or even the delivery of education, it's about other factors. But I think for art schools in particular, we haven't been able to tell our story very well, and it's important to me, and this is a wonderful forum for that and the fair itself, 
to really talk about the impact of art and design in the world um, because it has a unique moment in time, I think, to make impact. Um, the other thing that I would say about an, an art education is that it develops particular kinds of learning competencies that are the key competencies right now for where we are as societies in the globe. And uh, as that's better understood, I'm really out, out to, to kind of dis ban this notion of the starving artist, because our artists are not starving. They're actually doing very, very well. In fact, um, The Economist just did a new ranking of colleges um, through their own perspective, and um, RISD was in the top 2% in the country of uh, what our students are doing economically after school, uh, number 24 out of the, in the country, which was surprising to me, not so much, you know, as a as a badge of pride, but also to talk about the role of art and design in education and in culture at this uh, moment. So, but I think the big challenges are, aside from the economics, are also the expectations that are put on higher ed, where we used to be expected to provide a fabulous education for students and a fabulous research and learning environment for faculty. But now with the expectations on actually taking care of individuals, the parent expectation on how we take care of their kids, the um, notion of all the government compliance regulations on higher ed. It's become a very complex thing to run an institution. Mm -hmm. um, I, told, I know it's only been a short time actually sitting in the, in the hot seat of the press. What, what, what's been the new insight that's come to you now that you're actually in that position? that you maybe didn't think about when you were on the faculty? Well, I think part of the reason I decided to apply for the president role is because I, the opportunity um, seems vast right now. And I'm actually surprised by how quickly we're making progress about spreading the word um, in the globe and connecting partnerships around the globe about how much the institution of an art and design school can do to actually create positive change. I, I knew that, I mean, that's why I was interested in the role, but I'm actually very encouraged by seeing how quickly that opportunity is developing. Mm -hmm. And just for clarification, many of you know this, but Nicolas Institution was a standalone institution in Paris, essentially its own, although incorporating a museum, a big collection as well. Sanford at Columbia is in a a, a big uh, research university as one of its sort of professional schools, essentially. Your situation is also slightly different. Mm -hmm. You're f more focused, but you have an architecture school, art school, design school, and you have an alliance of a, of a kind with a major university down the street, Brown. Mm -hmm. And so now we come to uh, <laughs> yet another slightly different scenario, and you're right, they're all different. They're all different institutional realities. Uh, we go to Howard Zinger Zingerman. Um, who hopefully can give us a little bit more broader context because he's, he, it was really, I'm so happy that you're here today because you wrote a book called Art Subjects, Making Artists in the American University, where, and which is, you wrote it a while ago now, it's now I think in several editions out. Um, and you're somebody who's an MFA, you have a PhD in visual culture, and you've now started running recent, not that long ago, the Hunter Arts Department. So whether it's in response to the others or just in general, just give us a few broader top line observations about what ails or, or boosts art schools today. The, uh, when I'm, art subjects came out in 1999 and, and when people have asked what the greatest change is since the publication in 1999 and the, the present, I'm afraid my answer is the old fashioned <coughs> economic one and that there is a way in which across the 20th century the discourse on art schools has always, um, for good or ill, been around or noted the number of students that come through art schools and don't end up working as mm -hmm. an artist and how one characterizes that, whether they, they characterize that as bildung or as failure or as the possibility of creating um, critics or gallerists or curators, many of the best of whom were once art, were once would be artists or lapsed artists. Um, Do we have a, a sense, by the way, of roughly what percentage that is? Um, I would like to say 
Hunter does much better than any other place, but I think that it's probably, when you look 10 years out, about 10% of MFAs are continuing to uh, make work and continue a studio practice. So 90% um, leakage into other... Into fields. other, into the broader arts industries most, most frequently. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, or into the world, or this could be what Alan Caprow called the education of the unartist, mm -hmm. which is to take uh, arts education as though it were a liberal education, as though it were a critical education, because I think at its best, and at its most ethical, that is what it, what it is. Um, Nicola's comment about making citizens was part of the discourse around art schools across the 20th century and what art schools could do. But I think the difference when students come out with six-figure debt, the idea of creative failure is less sort of possible, you know, less entertainable. Um, so I would say that that's, I mean, that is my basic response. And then in terms of just observations, I would say that I would just note that there are over 200 MFA programs in the United States. And they're situated differently in relation to the art world that will become our subject, geographically different, and within individual art schools or art departments like, to take for example RISD or the large state schools in, in the Midwest, they're within those art departments or art schools different art worlds and different relations to what we imagine the art world that Art, art, that art Basel describes, whether they are, are printmakers or jewelers or metal workers or um, furniture designers or, so these, so I guess I would say that one of the problems of the, that this conversation might wanna think about, um, but also of art schools is the relation of the specific and the general. Mm -hmm. Well, all these subjects are out on the table. I mean, we've got money, we've got the whole question of uh, monastery or airport or both, uh, the, the, the enormous expectations and, and the sense that you just described that actually for many, uh, this is a can, kind of an alternative to regular college for broad preparation for tomorrow's cultural industries and if that's what it is, and in fact the 90% are going elsewhere, then what exactly are we teaching? So I want to stop on a few points, just drill down a bit, and first about this teaching. So, um, I mean, there are schools that have sort of done away with formal curricula, or significantly have done away. Um, but I think certain things, the crit sessions, and certain things are widely prevalent. So two quick questions to anyone on the here. Who do you have in mind? when you design the curriculum, when you think about the curriculum, and is the sort of menu of pedagogy that we offer the right menu today? Anyone? <laughs> Nobody dares well, to I'll, say I'll anything. jump in. I, you know, I think it's important to note that the faculty really designed the curriculum. So um, there, of course, is a mission within a school, and there's an approach, and there's resources and facilities, um, but the purview of the curriculum design is always in the, in the role of the faculty member. Right. Um, having said that, the disciplines are changing dramatically. And although we are an art and design school, if I go to the master's MFA show and look at the graduate work, I always look at the work and try and guess what department the student is from, and I'm often wrong, um, because work has taken such a broad landscape of influence um, that the notion of what it means to be a printmaker or a sculptor or a furniture designer even is, um, is, is very broad now and in a wonderful way. Uh, however, I mean, we're still very committed to teaching the rigors of the discipline because it's a, it's a thinking process, it's a cognitive process as much as it is um, an outcome-based process. But the um, technology has changed everything and, and communication and the sense of global network with other artists and other opportunities and projects and exhibitions and events has changed dramatically in the last decade. So the complexity of teaching in a contemporary way, understanding all the traditions of a discipline and the rigors of learning the, the basic skills, but the skills in the context of theory along with all of the burgeoning opportunity that is really redefining where one discipline begins and ends um, is, is absolutely the, the, the situation in contemporary art education. Mm -hmm. 
And it's, it's terrifying, I will say, but it's also incredibly exciting um, to think about, so. Um, <clears throat> at Columbia, our situation is a bit more bifurcated because there is the undergraduate program and the graduate program, which um, are very different. Um, the fact that the undergraduate students at Columbia are pretty much there for other fields, and some may get seduced into the visual arts, others take it as a class to fulfill an elective. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so my approach to those classes is very much a, a traditional uh, workshop um, situation. However, I do add some you know, field trips and a lot of discussion and dialogue because I think another important thing about being an artist is how you process information and filter and think because that ultimately becomes the voice of whatever practice you embark on. But with the graduate students, it's a much more open um, scenario where it's, you know, obviously the critique, the staple critique is in there. But I'm finding now, and I just, I should probably preface this by saying I was in Berlin for the last eight months, and in speaking with colleagues there and seeing how things are happening, particularly in Berlin, um, my approach with the MFA students is partially as a mentor instructor, but now it's become being almost, you know, putting them in a more apprentice like situation, mm -hmm. where it might be as valid for me to take them out with me to go to gallery openings and talk and see people and sort of let them free into the world for a minute to really feel how it is. Mm -hmm. But once I get them back to school, I have to make the disclaimer like, you know, this, you know, there are many art worlds. Mm -hmm. It doesn't always have to be Chelsea for you. It doesn't have to be New York at all, mm -hmm. which is a hard argument when you're in the middle, in the belly of the beast, mm -hmm. you know, talking yes. about this. And we'll get back to it. Yeah. Nico, by the way, do you, does your, did your faculty get to decide the curriculum or? Was this? Uh, um, yes, for the most part. But there are some uh, benchmarks that we do have to meet for the Columbia undergraduate um, fulfillment. Right. But what for the master's program, it's a lot more free. And how does that work in Paris? Are there like ministry directives you have to follow? Or? Absolutely not. No. no. <laughs> Good. Hopefully. No. Hopefully. No. Otherwise, it would be a disaster. But well. Um, no, it is, the structure is very different because, for example, there is no difference between painting, sculpture, whatever multimedia, new media, you know, thing. It, it's, there's no disciplines at, 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 at first, you know. The, every student, and that's a very specific structure coming from 19th century, actually, and it used to be really old-fashioned, but now I think it's really contemporary, uh, has to um, get in, uh, engaged, committed towards uh, an artist, a teacher artist, you know, mm -hmm. who's the, in a studio, let's mm -hmm. say. And then it's a triangle. You, you can learn skills, techniques on one side, theoretical or historical knowledge on the other side, but the top of the triangle is this relationship that every student has with one teacher, you know, one mm -hmm. artist, international artist, teacher. Mm -hmm. And that, that's this triangle which makes it very, very, uh, very mm -hmm. specific. And that student that you're teaching, when you think of that student, is she someone who's going to end up with a lovely studio in Paris with a gallery? Yeah, well... Or uh, not. That's a, a very universal rule, in a way, that you have a certain percentage of people who are actually... who will actually achieve their exact, you know, goal that, mm -hmm. that they had when they entered into an art school. Mm -hmm. But I'm not afraid of that at all, actually. Uh, there was a very interesting British artist in the 1960s, John Latham, who created this uh, uh, association called Artist Placement Group. And he wanted artists at every level of society, in banks, you know, in uh, anywhere where they could actually work and influence the system. And I like mm -hmm. the idea that we also are actually uh, formating uh, people who will uh, approach, you know, mm -hmm. social life in a very different way because they were taught at, mm -hmm. in an art school. And, yeah. I, and I like this idea very much. Right. It's kind of, yeah, something that can also mm -hmm. uh, be as interesting as only the, the very, you know, uh, professional uh, mm -hmm. art world-ish, you know, uh, mm -hmm. career. Because you can make that case about the law, although I think that if you took a law school that only 10% of its artists remain lawyers, I think that law school would not be judged very favorably. Anyway, let's move on to money. Unless I, Howard, you yeah, have I, a point. I did want to. Um, I did want to say that um, <laughs> the curriculum at Hunter is strongly faculty 
driven, driven, as Roxanne mm -hmm. was saying, and that there is a real sense of the difference between what an undergraduate education in studio art for studio art majors is and a graduate education. And But one of the things I really have to say is that watching the faculty at Hunter discuss these issues on an ongoing basis, what a student should come into or out of a mm -hmm. foundation year with, um, what they want for their students on the undergraduate level, to see them work really closely with one another as colleagues uh, about in concerning the trajectory of individual students on the graduate level, and this has to do with what kind of art history they need, what mm -hmm. sense of who they who it is they should work with next. Mm -hmm. This, I mean, it's it's a really you know, there is no, I don't, I can't. I don't think that there is a single curriculum that will work across the board and for every place. I know that at Hunter, there is a real sense of what kind of artist and what kind of citizen they want sort of mm -hmm. it, it, to come out of it. They, they actually tend to resist new technologies and doing another MFA and another tiny slice of something or in, mm -hmm. in the commercial or... Um, uh, I mean, just because of the tradition of where we are and the kinds of artists that Hunter has tended to make. Mm -hmm. But there's a real active and continuing negotiation as to what the curriculum is, but also the relation of that curriculum to any individual artist. Let's talk about money, everyone's favorite subject. We are at an art fair, after all, so money has to be a key issue. Um, Roseanne, you did say a few minutes ago that actually the, the reason why the costs are rising uh, that there are other reasons which are sort of inescapable. Can you just very briefly explain what you meant by well, that? In our formula, the biggest majority of our cost goes to people, so it's salaries and benefits, um, mm -hmm. which are, you know, very, the benefits don't, um, <laughs> don't follow the tuition and mm -hmm. uh, uh, cost of tuition increase. But it's also the, the, the varied roles that we have to take on as institutions. So there's a lot more investment in things like compliance and assessment mm -hmm. and all of that. Um, but, but I do want to sort of flip that question a little bit to say that um, if we look at who's coming to recruit from our institution, um, are there, this generation is not so interested in things the way that other generations were. You know, there was a lot of talk about the sharing economy, the sense that students don't want to own homes or cars anymore. They, they have the same opinion about what they make and, they, and what they can do with their talents. And, you know, we have recruiters coming to RISD from venture capital firms, from healthcare industry, the State Department, the CIA recruits at RISD. I mean, it's a broad band of places coming to look because they're looking for creative intelligence. And a lot Literal, of uh, literally, literally, well, yeah, in some <laughs> cases, but but a lot of our students really want to connect their talents and their creative abilities with making a, a big impact in the world in in ver across industries. Mm -hmm. So, and, and I don't want to imply at all because I don't believe it that art should be at the service of these other industries. But if we are talking about creating c creative societies. Who better to be in the in the thought leadership places than artists and designers? Mm -hmm. um, so I'm very excited about seeing that change. And when you think about cost in those terms, and you know, in terms of investment and you know, return on investment, which is not a way I like to think about education, but unfortunately, with the cost of education, it's naive to think that people aren't looking at those formulas and those ratios. But in fact, when you look at, um, you know, our statistics are a little higher in terms of 68% uh, of our graduates in the last survey were actually working as practicing artists and designers, and then another 30% were actually working in some industry where their creative um, education was playing a major role. So, um, and you know, 10 MacArthur Fellows and the, the whole thing, we, I think, um, I, I think those all point to the fact that there is a great value in a serious commitment to an art education. But I also think that as societies, we need to expect and demand and celebrate the fact that so many people with these incredible creative minds are actually having influence from in government, in healthcare, mm -hmm. in all kinds of industries. Right, um, right but the fact remains that these costs are exorbitant, mm -hmm. so and it, which is an easy fact to bemoan. Mm -hmm. So, 
if, if, if the premise to some extent is these are high costs, what actual, actual measures can be taken to reduce them? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I'm asking all of you here, it's very easy to, to bemoan these costs, but how do you actually offer a meaningful education at lower cost? Mm -hmm. is, this, is this a problem of the university, or is it, the, is it a problem of the way education itself is structured, or what are the, what are the, how can we get around all this? Well, in my opinion, I think it's still part of that industrializa uh, industrialization conversation that education in America itself has been, you know, it's becoming big business. It's a very big business. So the costs go up, and it's very difficult for the students to survive. And once again, at Columbia, for my undergrads, you know, many of them are not going to go into a profession as an artist. However, they are definitely influenced by, um, especially those who take a particular interest in the visual arts, when they go on the world, they do apply that knowledge to their field. Mm -hmm. It's a different um, story with the MFA students, and I never really thought this way until I was at Columbia, but when you have a student who's faced with the you know, insane amount of debt that these students are going to come out with, they have a right to expect something to come back. Yeah. And so I can't really um, accuse them of anything when they sound like professionals or want to be careerists. Mm -hmm. So that's when you sort of have to step in and figure out how do we navigate this. To be a careerist, does that mean that you blindly go out and try to become an art star um, in between your freshman, your, your first and second year? Do you pace yourself and become an artist? But at, you know, once again, what professional talents do you have, or skills, you, uh, skill sets do you have to go out in the world and try to make a living so that yeah. you can pay this debt back? Well, and we're right at the threshold of delving into that, but stay, I want to stay on you, Sanford, because I know this is a subject you care about. To what extent is this cost issue also translate into a diversity conundrum? Um, well, if you would have asked me this around two years ago, um, I would sit in some of the faculty meetings at Columbia and just be appalled. Um, but then a few weeks ago, I'm standing in a room and I've seen more brown and trans students than I ever have. And I was like, oh my God, is this my school? So it goes, there's an ebb and flow to it. It's very strange. Mm -hmm. But I think when you start talking about diversity, and this is you know, beyond a color diversity thing, you know, obviously we're talking about gender and preference and so on, but class really comes into play. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm sorry, I lost my train of thought. <laughs> so, You're, so you were saying that diversity is not just about uh -huh. demographics, it's also about class. That's where you were at this moment. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, I have to get back on that train of thought. I'll, <laughs> I'll get back to it, though. Yeah, you were saying that things are looking a little more diverse in, at Columbia, mm -hmm. for example, than a few years oh, ago. Oh, yeah, but I was also, you know, trend. as far as um, a class, this is a systemic thing in education from elementary school all the way up. Mm -hmm. So when I don't see a certain amount of at least color diversity on the graduate level, um, mm -hmm. it's not just because the people aren't out there or the people who aren't out there have never been allowed to be there because mm -hmm. this system starts so young that there's people excluded from that. Can, uh, I, can I just stay in the United States for, for just a minute and talk about money? The, um, w one, I c came from Los Angeles and the MFA book, I received my MFA there and the book is written really with the kind of LA art world and the LA art schools which were the f that kind of in many ways, the cutting edge of thinking about, or where the cutting edge was of thinking about what MFA programs have to do with making art worlds, with building art worlds, because in a way quite different than the gallery system in New York, the, the system in Southern California was powered by graduate schools. At the same time, when everyone, anyone ticks off a list of the graduate programs in Southern California, CalArts, Art Center College of Design, until recently USC, UCLA, maybe Otis sometimes, maybe UC Irvine sometimes, that list never includes the largest MFA programs in Southern California, which are Cal State Fullerton and Cal State Long Beach. Mm -hmm. And that's class. It's race and class, and yeah. it's right mm -hmm. there. Yeah. That's certainly true, and, and, and uh, those are almost sort of invisible schools. Um, one other brushstroke to this topic of diversity, which relates to Europe, as I was researching what's going on in art schools these days, I noticed a recent announcement, I think at Goldsmiths, where they've created positions for um, exiled Syrian students uh, or refugees, and they are now beginning to work on a curriculum uh, around this. Uh, I guess, Nicola, I'm going to throw this to you. Is there a discourse in Europe that 
uh, higher education, art schools, perhaps have a new mandate in uh, articulating a new kind of more diverse society? Yes, there is. Um, the, but the thing is, we don't have the same kind of money issues, and we'd have, there's no such thing as a debt when you go out you know, from school, you know, when you're doing an art school. But sometimes it's mm. hiding also the a kind of um, yeah, lack of diversity, you know, and we shouldn't in Europe hide behind this, you know, to, to, to mask the fact that there is less and less diversity in our, in our schools, uh, and we have to, to fight also for this. For example, by um, inventing prep schools, you know, in very specific uh, areas uh, of, of, uh, of Paris, for example, you know, mm -hmm. this is something that should be done, you know, mm -hmm. and that's very important to re recruit and propose uh, such careers to people who might not have the idea of, the, of, of uh, in, entering into these zones. So, yeah, it, it might be also more hypocritical, you know, mm -hmm. uh, somehow in, in Europe. Yeah. Uh, but it's a concern, yeah. yeah, it's a public concern, I would say. It's, and it's going to be a very interesting narrative, I think, to follow in the coming years. All right, let's talk about our putative topic, although all of these things describe our topic in various ways. The question of how do we prepare for the art world? Do we prepare for the art world? Should we prepare for the art world? First of all, is this, you know, the ivory tower trade school, is this sort of a false dichotomy to begin with? Um, and is there anyone here, to the extent that it is a valid dichotomy, is there anybody here who's able to make a case for the ivory tower approach? That we should sort of look at this as a sanctum <laughs> where it's about ideas and skills and let the grown-ups worry about... That would be zero out of four? Maybe Sanford? Uh, no, I have no, no argument for it, actually. <laughs> but I will say there is a regionalism that I think is involved, and I think it even goes back to the diversity and the class issue. Um, and one of the reasons being is that for people of less economic means to go for an MFA in the first place, they're taking certain risks, risks on. And they usually come in with a different type of professionalism um, than students who have more of a luxury, and it's something that they may or may not continue with. Mm -hmm. And I think the regional question comes in because certain schools, once again, are not necessarily looking at a Chelsea um, right. Art Basel outcome. Mm -hmm. um, they are happy with being in Albuquerque and running a studio. Right? Mm -hmm. There's many, many options. There's right. myriad options. Mm -hmm. Or even leaving the country and becoming international and finding a place to live in Berlin. There's mm -hmm. so many ways to go about it. So, um, so what resources do your schools past or present, provide, very briefly, specifically to prepare artists, beyond the sort of taking a student under your wing and carrying him around openings? Are there specific courses or sections of the curriculum devoted to survival skills in the art world? Anyone? But, Nicola, you want to start? No, just in, in, in Paris, we have a you know, regular basis uh, lectures, you know, from professionals. It could be lawyers, to from to gallerists, to anything that prepares actually to to the future, you know, pragmatic, you know, career of the artist. But it's it's not exactly, uh, it's not a specific, you know, uh, training. It's just uh, information every every Monday, if I remember well. You know, it's mm -hmm. Um, we offer a class that has, you know, very pragmatic issues like um, how to make a proper CV, how to write out to um, a person that you may have met in the street or in an opening and follow up. Very basic, basic things. And you say we offer it or is it compulsory? It's compulsory for second year students. MFA level or? MFA level. MFA. Um, yeah, I'm speaking strictly about the MFA. Mm -hmm. But I think this is where sort of the age old tradition of the mentorship apprentice relationship mm -hmm. comes in because there's practical knowledge. And I think one of the reasons that um, you know, art professors have a hard time teaching some of the practical knowledge is because there's no one path for an artist to become successful mm -hmm. or to mm -hmm. become sustainable. So it's very idiosyncratic. Mm -hmm. But once you take an artist, a young artist under your wing and show them or show her the options that you have or that might be available, they can start to strategize their own way through it. Roseanne, how is it at RISD? Yeah, I, I used to always say to my graduates that the most important creative um, project that you'll ever do is that of your own career, because everyone has to design his or her own career. We happen to have a career center that does a, has a huge, robust amount of programming, and in many of the departments, there is a required professional 
practice degree. Um, but, I, but one of the things I think that's different than in Europe is that we have essentially no government support for the arts in this country. And in many other countries, there are um, opportunities for artists coming out of school to be mentored and to be provided with funds and residencies, et cetera. And here we have to rely on the private sector and the foundation sector. And I was thinking yesterday, walking the fair, I, overhearing some of the purchases that were being made, that if, if every single person who was making a purchase here was interested in sponsoring one student through an art education, it would totally transform the future of the art world. Mm -hmm. And so somehow, it, since we don't have it in our government agencies, we need to understand that private individuals who care about the arts have to step up and support artists. And that's, mm -hmm. it, it doesn't, as you said, just happen at the, at the college level, it happens at the education level from K mm -hmm. through 12. There's an enormous amount of disparity about exposure to arts and to music and to performance mm -hmm. in the public school system across this country, and it's only going to get worse unless we take a political stand and also a, a private stance around that. Point well taken, but do you offer courses about art world survival Yeah, schools? absolutely. No, we have required professional practice courses in many of mm -hmm. the departments, and then we have a huge menu of um, workshops that our career center does, mm -hmm. and we also have hundreds of internships every year. Mm -hmm. Internships, if you yeah. know. Yeah, how are you? Nodding actively. Well, I mean, I'm, one of the things that, that I would just want to state is that art schools, insofar as they're engaged with contemporary art at all, teach mm -hmm. the art world. Uh -huh. it, it, insofar as what they're, and this is something that the painter Raymond Parker wrote in 1953, is that what, that it, in lieu of teaching art, because art is a very difficult thing, or an impossible thing to teach according to some 20th century adage, that, that what art schools teach is the art world. That is to say, they teach what the present and the recent past have looked like, mm -hmm. and they re teach the lineages of, the, of that recent past. And so insofar as we introduce students to, you know, we, that what we're engaged with is, is in fact the practices of um, contemporary gallery or post-gallery or anti-gallery situations, that is to say, the, the spectrum across Art Basel and the complainers about Art Basel, or the crit critics of Art Basel. Of, of whom there are many. Of whom there are many. That basically, in some way or another, we're def that constitutes the contemporary art world. Mm -hmm. And what we tend to teach, I think, or, or a crucial part of our curriculum um, in any art school that's actually doing an ethical job of teaching has to do with a whole series of proper names, whether names of movements or names of artists or mm -hmm. names of possibilities or names of institutions. So we're teaching the art world. But not only that, I think your remark suggests that beyond teaching the art world, you're also in a very powerful position to articulate we are a case for what the art world should become. Right, do and you, I do guess you feel my, that that's a role of art schools. Indeed, and I would say that my, you know, when I first saw your question, that that should art schools prepare their students for the art world? One of my initial responses is: Is this the art world art schools should be preparing their students for? And, is it? Is it? And well, I'll leave that out there. <laughs> uh, but let me just say that at Hunter, just own up to the fact that at Hunter we do, I think at the BFA there's a professional practices course or component, but at the MFA level, our students, um, in part because of, the, of economic need, are, are busy working in the art world. They're working in galleries, they're working as art handlers, they're, they're working as Sanford's production designer, they're, you know, they're, they are already at work. Let me have a quick show of hands. Who might have a question, just so I know to prepare? Uh, okay, good. Um, well, you know, just staying on that, as everyone here knows, in recent years, the anxiety around this issue has been not whether we do enough to prepare these kids for the art world, but do we protect them enough from the art world? You know, there was a, particularly at Yale, you know, uh, Columbia, this sort of um, slightly troublesome sight of uh, art dealers, you know, in graduation shows um, when the market's hot is, is something that's um, been an issue in the art world. So t let's look at it from that side. So to what extent, what, what is it that we must keep out? Are there any red lines in terms of 
you know, how permeable should the, the boundaries be between the, the commercial business and students? You know, are there dangers perhaps in exposing students too early to that side of the art world? Without making this a doctrinaire question, what are the right approaches to it? I'm wondering if we're, um, we should actually use the words prepare or protect, because both ways, it's kind of a you know, black and white you know, uh, situation in a way. Uh, and I'm wondering, maybe it's not about this, uh, because let's back to something much broader, um, which is the fact that actually, I was thinking about it, uh, schools, art schools are actually preparing um, some people to be themselves, you know? What do they teach? Singularity. How will you, you will actually become, as an artist, someone who makes, produces something which has not been done before? So how can we teach that, you know? Uh, please be free. More or less, that's the... That's the incitation that uh, art schools are doing. But it's, it's possible. But it's a bit like uh, the Shaolin temple, if you want. You know, mm -hmm. you, you have to, uh, we, we teach them to get inside of themselves, uh, to mm -hmm. be singular and individual. Uh, it's not something that, it's not like a low school. Uh, right. So it's very difficult. You cannot teach someone to be free, or to be original, or to be singular, or to be unique. But you can teach her or him um, how you can reach that point, you know? Mm -hmm. And through diversity, the, the offer has to be absolutely uh, huge, I think. But it's precisely um, in this context that I think the question ju I just asked is a pressing one. Because if your goal is to make sure that there's a kind of character development and creative development that takes place, um, uh, is there a tension between that freedom and a, a young artist looking at what's selling in the galleries and trying to orient herself in that direction. Well, I agree with uh, what Nicola said and it's sort of what I was referring to before in terms of teaching or trying to um, help artists become empowered by their uniqueness, by their um, singularity, by their vision. Um, because once again, teaching in Manhattan, it's unavoidable that my students are going to be approached by galleries, and whether it's behind, you know, at, you know, sanctioned by Columbia or involved with Columbia or out on the street or in Brooklyn one night, it's going to happen. So the preparation really is how do you handle it when it comes to you? What is that you want? Are you ready? What is your trajectory? Are you ready for all that? Or do you want to go to market prematurely and maybe, you know, um, shortstop your career before it starts off? You know, so we have to, I feel that I would be remiss not to explain some of the risks um, that are apparent if they're a little overly aggressive. Mm -hmm. But protect and prepare, I mean, preparation is one thing, I, don't, I, can't, I can't protect adults. <laughs> These people are, you know, you got a 35 year old, they're ready, they're ready yeah. to go. Maybe, maybe mediation is a kind of... Yeah, mediation, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I'm going to take a couple of questions because I have a feeling the questions will speak to these issues unless you had a thought on your lips. I was just going to say one thing about it. If you look to your point, if you look at actually how we're teaching, um, we're, we're rewarding in a sense individuality more than um, following a path like the master. So at the, even from the first year in the undergraduate program, if a student does something like someone else, it's not seen in the same light as if they do something unique and, and, and that really comes from who they are as individuals. So that same student manifesting out into the art world isn't necessarily going to want to jump on a bandwagon that already exists. They're going to be looking for an independent means mm -hmm. of practice. Mm -hmm. And um, I mean, most good art schools, all of the faculty are also practicing artists or designers. So they are, um, but the students don't want to do what their faculty are doing, just like they don't want to do what their parents are doing. So I think if you actually dissect the way they're learning, that will translate into how they're approaching their professional lives. I also um, think that we've left out technology in this conversation. And I think that t technology, and I think it totally changes uh, the potential of what some of our students are capable of. Mm -hmm. So we as educators, in preparing them for an art world, we have to also be careful that we're not defining that art world before they can create that art world. I think you're burning to say that RISD just introduced recently a course of actually hardcore coding, computer coding, not you, you know, using Photoshop, but actual source code coding, which I think is a 
uh, a great, great yes. idea that other schools yeah. should adopt. Um, let me take a few questions, and for those who are, uh, we have, do we have a microphone? Uh, there's a microphone here, and is that a question? Yes, please say your name and if you represent an institution, if you'd like also. Thank you. Uh, my name's Karen Leader. I'm a professor of art history up at FAU in Boca in a studio department with art history as well. And my question is for all of you to perhaps comment on, which is that my experience is that the best artists in this fair, working in the world, are well-educated. And well-educated in the broad sense of I love the idea of art education like any other education as liberal education. And I think that the most important thing we can do is not lose sight of the fact that artists who do research, who follow through on the questions that they're posing, are the ones who are most likely to have successful careers as artists, aside from all of the professional development they might get. And I want to ask how we can keep that priority at the top of everything that we do as, as educators and as artists. Here, here. Any, uh, would anyone would like to amplify that point or respond to it? I, I guess that has been, that was the argument for why art schools belong on college and university campuses. That is a, uh, a century old argument that has gone through variations, but my favorite form of it is Dan Flavin, who said that it's precisely not in the kind of reproduction of tr the tr traditional media or the traditional um, uh, craft skills that one learns to be an artist, but one learns to be an artist by being, as he put it, a Robin Hood in the university. And sort of taking what you need, where you need it, and when you need it from a, a broader array of knowledge. Now, I don't know if I would be quite so either or as Dan Flavin, but that is a really, I mean, it is an opportunity that, um, that artists have. And as you say, many of the best of them do, have, best artists have availed themselves of this opportunity across the university. Yeah, in, in a way, we, one could say that, you know, the first years, the students have to learn how to steal, you know. <laughs> they, they, are, they go to crime school, you know, they are learn to burglarize the history of art and take what they need. And then the next years, they will have to learn how to use what they've stolen, mm -hmm. which is more or less, uh, much more exciting, actually. Mm -hmm. But anyway, that's the... And so the diversity of uh, the... Um, places they go for stealing is really important. You know? And uh, especially also the, the skills that they can acquire, which m according to me might be as diverse as possible. Mm -hmm. From the most forgotten techniques you know, to the most up-to-date you know, computer programming or whatever. You know, it's, it's really important to offer a huge range of uh, techniques and skills. Next, uh, there's uh, someone over there. There's are you with, are you, oh, you're a question asker. <laughs> yeah. Good, please. Um, um, so I'm, I'm a BFA graduate from a pretty good university in New York. And as a graduate, I've been lucky enough to have the opportunity to be a working artist. But the reality of the matter is that many of my peers didn't, you know, are not working artists and have been struggling, especially because they have this huge debt they have to pay. Um, and I also had the opportunity to attend the MFA program, but I decided not to mainly because it was gonna pretty much end up in me being in a, around $100,000 worth of debt. Um, and seeing that you, aside from being part of art institutions, you're also artists or art educators. So outside of that, I wanna know what recommendations would you give to artists and students who decide not to um, not to go through with that and not to put themselves in that economic situation. In other words, is there another pathway if you feel blocked by yeah, the system? Yeah, like what other suggestions you, you mm -hmm. would have for people that decide not to go mm -hmm. to um, art school? Um, uh, once again, New York is a very specific situation because of sheer numbers of artists and potential artists there are there. 
But I always tell artists, young artists, who are waiting and hoping for a patron or matron to make all these things happen, that they have to look around at their own personal network of artists because those are the real supporters. Those are the people who are doing the late nights in the studios, assisting them with uh, materials, introducing them to curators, and sharing whatever um, resources they may have. So at that stage, I would tell them to you know, get together, get with your friends, start a gallery, start a museum, start a studio, buy a building, do the whole thing yourself, bring the attention to you once you've set it up. Um, you know, the professionalism of the art world is a very recent occurrence. Artists have been doing it for themselves forever, so you shouldn't lose that spirit just because of a degree. I guess I would say that, that art schools, um, I, I know, have responded in some sense to the, there's a school in, in LA, the name of which I won't mention, that has basically said, we want our BFAs to come out as strong as the MFAs do, and um, because, precisely because as a private school, we don't want to shackle them with another two to three years of debt. And so we want a BFA that comes out knowing, uh, making work, having a real sense of what their own practice is, being able to imagine continuing that practice over a period of decades, and to, but also to understand that they are a cohort, that they are the beginnings of a network, that they're beginnings, the beginnings of a community, and that um, to broaden it beyond LA or, or New York, to understand that many of the 200 and some odd graduate art schools in the country have built art worlds around them. Whether those art worlds are in Miami or Albuquerque, as you were saying, or elsewhere, that, that are communities that have galleries that need um, artists, gallerists, writers, curators, um, um, all of the audiences, and, and in a sense, aren't copies or provinces of the New York art world, but are increasingly independent worlds. And it also bears mentioning that a number of these new initiatives, as I mentioned there, in the, a couple of them are in the art newspaper today, which are beginning to provide some alternate, I mean, don't, let's not fool ourselves. The institutional accreditation is a huge entry ticket into the world behind this wall. But I think we can't explain that away, but there are initiatives bubbling up. So sure, maybe everywhere. the right question would be, you know, is the art market prepared for the new artists that are actually arriving? Well, yes, yes. And probably also worth pointing out that this issue is true for all of higher education. And I think in the next few years, we'll see a great deal of innovation around uh, DIY education and massively provided online education. Maybe two more quick questions. Uh, do I have someone here in the, near the front? Is there a microphone? Oh, yeah. okay, fine. It could be Hi, more. well, um, from Mexico City. I studied art, but I work at an auction house, so it's, I'm in the middle of the creation on the market, <laughs> but from the outside and inside. My question is, well, there it's like three questions, but all together. Because you said in America, well, they're like about 10% of the students are really active artists. Uh, first, I want to know, Nicolas, in Europe, and mainly in Paris, if it, this also happens, or there are more active artists from, that come from school. And um, I was wondering if you, or what you think is the reason, because I don't think it's just the economic uh, thing that it's expensive to study or something. Be because if you want to be an artist, maybe you can be self-taught if you don't have the economic media to, to pay the school or whatever. But what it, in Mexico also happens that there are a lot of students and at the end of the career, uh, just I think also like 10% are active artists. And I, this is, I think that's a problem because at first, when, uh, at least in Mexico, when, they, when you're young, you say, I want to, to study art. It's a, dif a difficult uh, decision to take because all, everybody says, you are going to starve. But <laughs> maybe it's not uh, the reality, but 
it's supposed to be the difficult decision to decide to study art, but no, they decide to study art and then they leave that and maybe they mm. work as uh, professional. Can you phrase your question about things. this? So it's that, that tree, like uh, um, if in Europe the same happens that just a few are really so Nicholas, active or the and what you wonder the, the, numbers, the, the numbers are really worldwide, strangely enough. You know, it's, it's exactly the same, you know, everywhere. You know, but we have schools doing better than others, but uh, that's, uh, well, more or less between 5 and 10 percent. So it's, uh, you know, our, our school, in a way, could be described as uh, piloting schools, actually. You know, some will, will drive buses, some other trains, some others, you know, uh, uh, rockets. I think you get the best metaphor me medal award on this panel. Uh, one more question. One, maybe somebody a uh, gentleman back there. Yeah, um, I'm from Colombia, the country. Um, I just want to comment. Um, since 10 years ago, there's been like a lot of uh, art programs in different small cities, and you can see the impact in, in the cities because there, the, there's a lot of street art, and this is very interesting. So your work really changes society. So I just want to thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Um, perfect, perfect moment. This is so great. Perfect moment for me to pivot to the last question for which my panelists are not prepared. Um, um, and then we'll all be here if anybody wants to come up and meet us. So if you could wave your magic wand, and the magic wand has lots of money coming out of it as well. Um, um, and, uh, and if you had unlimited resources or significant resources and total freedom to build a new kind of art school from scratch, aiming for maximum cultural impact, what would you do? And we'll start with <laughs> Roseanne. <laughs> <laughs> we have 15 days to answer the question. No, no. Oh, oh. And by the way, you only have two sentences. I, I'm not sure it would be better, to be honest. I, I think that part of what artists really learn to do well is to um, be be incredibly imaginative in the in the realm of uh, limitations. I think limitations actually inform creativity. I think boredom informs creativity. And I think this notion that more is better is, is part of the problem of the whole art world and that really I would, um, in a way, ask, I think it would be a, a more, it sounds really awful to say from a college president, but in a way, a more exciting challenge to think about how to do more with less. Okay, that's an unusual use of the magic wand. <laughs> um, Howard, how would you go about it? I would take whatever Roxanne was not spending, and add it to mine. <laughs> <laughs> okay, to do what? Well, first of all, tuition free. Mm -hmm. And second of all, I sound like Bernie Sanders, whatever, I mean, it's like, but, but tuition free, so that the opportunity to both succeed or fail is just present. And then I think that, this is two sentences, or two seconds of thinking, I think I would actually like try to set it up as um, closer to a think tank so that the number of younger artists, students, and the number of, of working artists, faculty, were about one to one or two to one and just have a kind of working, living, talking situation with individual studios that people get to go back to, but to have um, a kind of flow of conversation that continues well outside the, the classroom walls and permeates through the studios. Can I just edit one thing on mine? Because I, um, of course I'm being a little bit tongue in cheek, but I, actually if I really could change one thing, it would be to extend the time. Um, I think that um, the idea of being fully developed in four years or two years and then practicing is not as good as the idea of having some education, working with peers, going out and trying some things, coming back for more education. If I really could restructure it, it would be to give it more time. Mm -hmm. Nicola. If, if I, 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 I might emphasize on one aspect of it, which is the, the team. I think what the, our schools are, staff, teaching staff. That's the most important thing. So I would take time to hire you know, the right 
staff. Mm -hmm. And people, pay them well. People, because people are the key. Mm -hmm. Sam. Okay, well, with four seconds to think about it. Um, exactly, you get I lucky. absolutely have no way to enact this type of system, but of course, striking tuition would be number one. Right. Um, but then maybe redirecting the money so that you can pay artists to take on apprentices. And then in a dream world, I would cut down the walls of all the schools so that you have access to staff and faculty at various institutions internationally using, you know, whether it's the internet or small group trips to work with your mentor in Australia or whatever it might be, um, and then pay that mentor some money to do that service, and it's free for the student. Well, um, we're coming to the end. I just want to say, if I had the magic wand, there's an artist named Dan Bales, who's in the position sector of Art Basel. As a matter of fact, he, he's a, he's a on the short list of the BMW Art Journey Award, and his project is about Black Mountain College. Uh, you should all check it out. He's been researching Black Mountain College. And yesterday when I was talking to him, he said, I'd like to buy Black Mountain College and, and start something. So that's what I would use the magic wand for. Look, there's no magic wand, but I think this conversation has certainly illustrated the vitality and diversity and importance of art schools. And I just want to thank everyone here for your thoughts and enjoy the show.